Welcome, everyone, to our uh, next to last webinar in the uh, series. It's being sponsored by Modal Shop and Larson Davis. And today we wanted to talk about uh, human vibration and, and some of the issues that are associated with that. Uh, appreciate you uh, setting aside a little time to spend with us today. And hopefully we have some information that you'll find valuable and useful in your work. Today. So something that's uh, relatively new to some of us is vibration exposure. This the concern of vibration exposure to worker kind of began in Europe with their physical agents directive requiring uh, member countries to measure and monitor workers exposure to vibration because medical evidence has shown that there is a risk of injury due to repeated consistent exposure to vibration. And it's also something that's very commonplace in the workplace. And uh, just to kind of uh, reiterate that a little bit, there was a statement made by the Department of Defense here. I've kind of highlighted the key things in here because I don't like to have slides with a whole bunch of stuff on it to read. So this is the worst one you'll have here. But the uh, there's an acronym used in the industry called HAVE or HAVES. It stands for Hand Arm Vibration Syndrome. Um, that's what happens after repeated uh, exposure to vibration. A note here in the middle, it says it's an irreversible medical condition of the fingers and hands, which causes loss of sensation and blood supply to the hands and may cause loss of fingers in severe cases. Now that's, my, that's my added part there. And the other key thing is at the bottom of that statement, uh, is even by conservative estimates, as many as 1.25 million power tool users may be at risk in the US uh, from the Department of Defense. So the risk is significant. And uh, so we want to talk about it a little bit uh, here today, what it is, how to determine if you're at risk, what to do about it, and uh, go over some of that. But before we dive into that, a little bit of just information in general. Exposure to human vibration is tends to be grouped into two broad classifications. One we call whole body vibration, and the other we call hand arm vibration. I think these are pretty self-explanatory, right? Whole body vibration is vibration of the complete body. Usually that's vibration that enters either through the feet or through the buttocks when somebody's sitting. Hand arm is pretty self-explanatory. That's vibration that enters the body, typically through some hand tool that's held. And uh, they're handled a little bit differently, and they have different limits, and so we'll talk about those. But let's just kind of go over a little bit here first, uh, maybe just some ideas of people or, or jobs that might be at risk for exposure to vibration. You can see here the list is long. It's by no means inclusive. But there are some some on here that uh, might be of interest to you, like, you know, dental technicians. You might not think they would be at risk, but uh, but they do hold a lot of vibrating equipment there. So. So I, the idea here is just to kind of keep an open mind as to who might be at risk, because it might not be where you expect it. But let's let's kind of. Uh, shift gear a little bit now and talk about the halves or the hand arm vibration syndrome. So this is the hand arm side of vibration, not the whole body. And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. And you can see here on the right, I have a, a few pictures to show you. The picture on the upper right is a milder case and you can see kind of the discoloration of the fingers there. The picture on the bottom right is a severe case where uh, blood flow is, is severely compromised. Um, you can see from this why sometimes this is also called white finger syndrome. Uh, another name is Raynaud's syndrome. So these are, these are some different names kind of for the same problem, the hand arm vibration syndrome or halves. And uh, a, few, uh, a few things that are symptoms of this syndrome are you can see they're cold fingers. Uh, it's interesting that uh, working in the cold is known to uh, exasperate halves. 
probably for obvious reasons because when your body gets cold it naturally cuts off blood flow and uh, and then the vibration exasperates that tingling or numbness in the fingers you know, the blanching or whitening as you can see in this photo now, the key thing to note is that it it can lead to permanent irreversible damage or, or health concerns and so it's not it's not an issue that if once the vibration goes away uh, the symptoms go away it can be permanent so of course the question we all ask ourselves is well gee how much vibration can a worker be exposed to and and avoid a risk of being injured permanently from that and uh the uh, as i mentioned at the beginning of the presentation the driver behind the regulation of exposure to vibration has been the EU. They have set some limits for member nations, uh, a threshold limit value of five meters per second squared, and an action limit of two and a half meters per second squared. Earlier on, the, uh, the US uh, had some recommended limits through the ACGIH that were slightly different from that. And more recently, though, the ACGIH has aligned their recommended exposure limits with the EU directive. And so they match up there. It's a TLV of five and an action limit of two and a half meters per second squared. And so those, those are the numbers. Now, it's important to note here that the risk of halves is due to repeated regular exposure to vibration. So it's a little different than noise that many of us may be familiar with. We know that, you know, one very loud exposure to noise can cause permanent hearing damage. Halves is a little bit different, you know, one one large shock typically doesn't cause permanent damage unless it's so big, you know, it squishes tissue or something like that, right? But uh, but the risk here that we're primarily talking about is the uh, risk due to repeated daily exposure. It's that worker who's using the hand tools every day, five days a week, year after year, that's really at risk. So let's assume that we're concerned that we might have a risk. We have workers that might be exposed to repeated high levels of vibration. And I should also note too, five meters per second squared is not that much vibration. When you start making measurements, uh, you're you can be surprised at uh, how little that is. So let's, let's assume we're concerned and we want to know what to do. Well, step one here is, you know, let's identify areas where we are concerned and we'll talk a little bit in some slides here about how to do that if we find that uh, gee maybe i have an area where i should be concerned and we want to take the next step we have some slides we'll talk about how to determine the exposure and take the next step to say do i really have a problem or is it just kind of a concern and then the third part is if we get through that determining exposure and say, yes, I do have workers being exposed to excessive vibration, what can I do? So we'll kind of go through those three steps there, identify, determine the actual exposure and control the risk here in, in our next few slides here. So the first thing to do that I recommend if you're con if you have a concern is start to ask some assessment questions of people and uh you know these are pretty obvious here i think for a lot of people but it's good to be reminded so you know first one there do you use handheld hand fed handheld tools or hand fed power equipment things where workers are are holding things that vibrate routinely that's a good question. If you are, then you know there's maybe a risk. A key risk is rotary action tools like grinders or polishers or things like that. These tend to produce a lot of vibration. The same with impact or percussive tools, uh, such as a chipper or or something like that. The uh, so so you can just kind of look at the tools used in in the workplace and say do i have some of these tools that are kind of known high risk tools if so um, 
you know, maybe you want to move on and determine the actual risk. A couple others there, if you have manufacturers supplying warnings, uh, that's a good sign you need to take action. Another one, this is a key one. If you have people um, after the work saying, gee, my hands are numb or tingling, that's a that's a significant sign that they're exposed to a lot of vibration. And we've probably all experienced this, right? I I had a blower one time that was a little bit off balance, and by the time I'd uh, I'd blow off my driveway and things for fifteen or twenty minutes, my you know my hands would be tingling. It produced so much vibration. So we all kind of know what that is. And the last one I think is pretty obvious. Also, if you actually have diagnosed cases of hand arm vibration syndrome, uh, that's a that's a significant sign that you need to look at the uh, vibration that your workers are being exposed to. So let's say we go down through that list and we answer yes to one or several of those, and uh, and we say we need to take a next step. We want to take a next step. What can we do? Well, the uh, there are a couple of processes we can go through. One of them is to model vibration exposure, and essentially what this is is you use predetermined tool vibration data. And uh, this could come from the tool manufacturer or or somewhere else. And you use that to mathematically model the amount of time the worker is working there, along with uh, that vibration to, to estimate an exposure. So there are some benefits to this. It's relatively easy and low cost, but there are some real challenges too. One of the big challenges is a lack of data. At, uh, at one time, NIOSH tried to produce and publish a database with vibration uh, a couple of years ago, though they turned that off. I think they found that keeping that up to date was just more than they could handle. So finding data for this can be a real challenge. Another one is just inaccuracies, and it's not that the data in the uh, in these tables is inaccurate. It's that the actual exposure for a worker can vary a lot depending upon the tool age condition the worker experience and actually where and how they're using the tool and so that kind of plays into it can not it can be not representative of actual working conditions and that leads to uh, significant errors in the estimated exposure and uh, just to kind of show you that here you know this is a table of measurements of some different tools here. And what you can see here with the yellow bar is the yellow bar highlights the lowest to the highest vibration measurements. So if you look there, like at that chipping hammer, the lowest measurement was somewhere below three meters per second squared, which would be an acceptable vibration level, clear up to 27 meters per second squared which would be way above the TLV. The area highlighted there in orange is the range over which 80% of measurements occurred. So you can look at the yellow is worst case, the orange would be typical. But you can even see with the orange, there's a large range there from about seven and a half to 15 meters per second squared for a chipping hammer. And, uh, and so to, to say that any chipping hammer is all the same uh, has some real problems and challenges to it, as you can see from this data here. And so, the uh, oh, let me get this thing to move on here. But if you choose that you want to go down that route, uh, there is a uh, a spreadsheet produced by the Health Safety Executive out of uh, the UK, and we'll make this available to you guys in our email. That, uh, that makes it very easy to put in a vibration of a tool and the time that was used, that the worker would use that tool and come up with a daily exposure. So it's, it's an easy way to kind of look at that. Just realize that there may be some significant errors in the result just due to the fact that there's not one vibration magnitude for each tool that's, that's very representative.
So, of course, that leads us to uh, option number two. If we determine modeling isn't a, a good option for ourselves, then the next option is to measure, to make actual measurements with the actual workers and the actual tools. And, of course, benefits there are you are you making measurements in your own work environment so you improve accuracy and you improve your risk assessment. Um, there are some challenges to this, though. It is more expensive. You have to buy equipment, and it takes time to make measurements. And also, measurements can be sometimes be difficult. There's a little bit of an art to making measurements because ultimately what you want to measure is the amount of vibration that couples into the human body, which can be different than the amount of vibration produced by the tool. And an example of that I might give would be something like a... Uh, a chainsaw. Uh, chainsaws produce a lot of vibration, and if you measure the chainsaw itself, you'd get high levels of vibration. But they also have vibration isolation built into the handle, and many times workers wear gloves and things like that that can provide additional protection. But you don't want to, and so the vibration pro, uh, that is produced by the chainsaw can be different significantly from what the worker actually experiences at their hand. So before we dive too far into measurement, uh, I want to cover a couple of things to make sure that we have kind of a basis of understanding. First thing I want to talk about is natural frequency, and, and this is important in understanding human vibration. Natural frequency is, you know, the frequency at which something will vibrate naturally. I put up here a picture of a guitar because we all know you pluck a guitar string, it'll vibrate at a certain frequency. Um, the same with most musical instruments. That's called a natural frequency. Almost all mechanical things have natural frequencies, including the human body. Um, there are frequencies which the hand arm will vibrate. There's frequencies at which the neck will vibrate. There's frequency which the chest cavity will vibrate. And it's important to understand these because it's those frequencies where the risk of injury is the highest. Uh, just because the vibration, you know, naturally occurs longer and longer, it doesn't dampen. This uh, this phenomenon is well understood by the scientists, and they have uh, they have created weightings for human vibration that highlight those frequencies where where the risk is highest. So there's one frequency weighting here, and it's graphed here. It's called the WH for hand arm, and you can see it tends to emphasize frequencies around 10 hertz maybe 10 to 20 hertz in this arena here. And that weighting curve is designed to measure the natural frequencies tend to be for most people, and therefore the highest risk. Frequencies, higher frequencies here, you can see that the risk is lower, and so the uh, they are less emphasized. So when making a measurement of human vibration, uh, these are all made with certain weightings, and the weighting depends upon what you're measuring. Like I say, this one here is for hand arms. So if you do a hand arm vibration measurement, you would want to, in your measurement system, apply this WH weighting to get an appropriate uh, vibration that represents the risk for hand arm vibration. With hand arm, it's pretty easy. There's one weighting. Uh, if you go to whole body, it becomes a little more challenging because the human body is a little more complex and, and things resonate at different frequencies. So there's different weightings here. Uh, this is kind of a list of them. I'm, I'm not going to go over those and talk about them all. Uh, just note that, you know, if if you're if you're concerned with vibration through the seat or the feet or, or the back or something like that, the human body frequency weighting that you would use to make that measurement varies. And if you need more information on that, there is more information in both the standards and uh, what's known as a good practice guide also. And uh, then I want to move on to just one quick slide on standards because uh, we tend to get a lot of questions from people. They might have a, a standard that they're trying to comply with that says, you know, you need to have vibration at a certain level. 
And and these some of these standards, not all of them, but some of them are listed over here on the right hand side. And they want and the question is, you know, how do I know what products are appropriate for measuring that vibration? And uh, once you understand it, there's kind of an easy solution to that. So all these standards here are standards for exposure to whole body vibration. If you read these standards, they have what's known as a normative reference. A normative reference means that it's another standard that's considered part of the requirements of these standards. And that normative reference would be the ISO 2631 series, which is measurement of whole body vibration. These standards here all have to do with measuring hand or worker exposure to hand arm vibration. They have a normative reference of the ISO 5349-1 and 2, which is how to measure hand arm vibration. Both of these standards have a normative reference to ISO 8041. ISO 8041 is the standard for equipment for measuring human vibration. So if you've got these down here, generally there's a path from there through normative references back to ISO 8041. And if you have equipment compliant with ISO 8041, then you have the right stuff for measuring vibration compliance. So let's uh, let's kind of move into and just like an example measurement system, and and this is our HVM two hundred, and uh, and it looks like this. This is a this is an instrument that can be worn on an arm or something like that. There's an app that you can run on your mobile device to communicate wirelessly. This little cube down here is called an accelerometer, and it's used to measure acceleration. And uh, part. Part of the challenge of making a, a human vibration measurement is figuring out how to mount that uh, that accelerometer to measure the vibration at the appropriate place. The, the ISO standards specify a number of adapters, and those are available from Larson Davis for doing this. Uh, you can see some of these adapters here. Uh, this one here. The accelerometer goes underneath here, and this is meant to be held in the palm. It's typically for measuring vibration inside of a glove. This one here, an accelerometer goes right here, and it goes between the fingers. So your fingers would go over here. This one here, an accelerometer goes right here, and it's meant to be held by the hand. So you would have, this could either come out uh, on either the left or right hand side of the hand, and the hand would fit over this bar. This one here is meant just to clamp to a handle or something if, you know, if that's the best you can do. And well, uh, and so, so there's some, some decision work that needs to go on to determine, you know, how and where can I make best make measurements. And there's some guidance in ISO 5349-2 on, on how to place accelerometers and make those measurements also. But one other thing I want to talk about is what do we actually measure? And I said we made we had a limit of five meters per second squared for TLV for hand arm vibration, but that five meters per second squared is actually acceleration. And acceleration is the rate of change for speed or velocity. And as I mentioned previously, we use a device called an accelerometer to measure that. And that's what the that's what the uh, limits are typically specified in. So uh, hopefully that kind of helps put things together. And also, acceleration is typically measured in three axes. And some of you may be familiar with this: the left hand or right hand coordinate system, right? And X, Y, Z, they're all orthogonal. That's how we measure the acceleration. And uh, then those are combined. Um, using a formula like this here for hand arm vibration into one overall vibration. And so it's a combination. The accelerometers, like the one shown before, measure all three axes. So you get an X value, a Y value, and a Z value that get combined. And that's what we measure. And here's kind of an example here of a screen from an HVM 200. So you can kind of see that. 
Here you can see we have the ARMS, that would be the acceleration value for X, Y, Z, and the sum. So that's after that uh, funny equation, right? Uh, this would be the peak value, a minimum value, and the, uh, the standards also specify a value called an MTVV, a maximum transient vibration value that's reported here. Um, by far the most commonly used value here is either this sum ARMS or these A8 values. And uh, these values here are acceleration normalized to an eight hour work shift. So in the case of this one here, this measurement only occurred for 23 seconds. The sum was 6.388 meters per second squared. So it would be above the TLV but because this was only for less than one minute, if you normalize that out over eight hours, it's not a risk unless the exposure continues for a longer time. So that's kind of a quick overview of what's measured in the metrics. Just like in noise, you can trade exposure for time. And uh, this is kind of a chart that shows you that. Uh, AHV is your acceleration in meters per second squared, and here's your vibration exposure time. So, for example, here, at one hour, I could be exposed to about uh, seven meters per second squared and, uh, and be below the action limit value. And I could be up here around uh, 15 before I hit the uh, ELV, threshold limit value. Uh, but of course, if I have that same limit and I go out to five hours, say I'm at the seven and I go out to five hours, now I'm going to exceed the threshold value. So you can exchange those. And uh, here quickly, just a uh, another sample data. I think we talked about that a bit and we talked about the AA, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. So let's move on now. So let's say we've made a measurement. We found that, hey, we have a risk and maybe we need to do something. Uh, what can we do? Well, as mentioned just previously, you can exchange exposure time for amplitude. And so one obvious thing is like you do with noise, you can rotate workers through high vibration tools so that they reduce their time at that and reduce their overall exposure. Or you can also break work into multiple shifts so that, you know, the, the high vibration work is done, again, by multiple people on, on different shifts. Um, that's, that's kind of an easy thing to do if it's, if it's an option and available in the, in the work environment. The next obvious thing is just to lower vibration levels. And uh, sometimes this is easy, sometimes it's not. Um, it's been found that how workers use a tool has a big effect on the vibration exposure that they have. And uh, there's there's measurements that show that inexperience or improper use of a tool can double the exposure. So sometimes, you know, if you learn that, just training on how to use it, how to minimize your risk can make a big difference. Also, you know, new tools, properly main tools tend to vibrate less than those that are poorly maintained. And uh, since uh, since worker exposure to vibration has uh, started to become an issue, then tool manufacturers are starting to uh, to measure the vibration of their tools, and there tends to be that newer tools can produce less vibration. So, producing a or replacing a tool is another way to potentially lower the the exposure to vibration. And of course, uh, you can use products like a vibration isolating glove to uh, to again limit some vibration levels. So just finishing up here, I wanted to give you just a few examples here to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about in a real world. This one here is a measurement of a forklift operator. The forklift is going from this smooth concrete floor to a floor made of small blocks. You can see over here in the data that on the smooth concrete floor, the vibration that the worker is exposed to is about 0.31 meters per second squared. Uh, on the small block, it uh, doubles essentially to 0.63 meters per second squared. Same worker, same tool, just where he drives it made a difference there. Uh, let's look at one 
look at some for hand arm tools. Uh, we'll first look at somebody uh, using a breaker here. And uh, so again, same worker, same tool. First of all, he's breaking large stones and rocks. And he has a very high exposure here of 24.4 meters per second squared. But now if he's breaking small rocks, it's almost half of that, 12.6. Still very high and well above the TLV, but much lower than the large stones and rocks. So it just depended on what was being broken. And uh, let's, let's look at just measurements with experience here. So again, here we have a worker up here with experience. And they have a vibration of about 4.2. Um, same job, same tool, worker without experience, much higher vibration level here. Um, a lot of that is believed to occur because as workers gain experience and training, um, they don't want to go home tired at the end of the day, so they learn how to manage the tools and use them in a, in a way that causes less, uh, less fatigue. But it makes a big difference there. So at that point, uh, I've reached the end of my presentation. Last thing I have here is uh, uh, last thing I wanted to remind you of is in this webinar series, we have one more next week. It's uh, Why Calibrate? The Importance of Accelerometer and Pressure Sensor Calibration. We invite you to attend that with us and uh, hope that you find good information there. And thank you for your attendance.